Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm going to talk about how to invest in precious metals and mining shares and how to try to improve one's performance. Um, part of my thesis is that those people who invest in gold and silver not only buy it and hold it in a vault against some financial Armageddon, but treat it as a financial asset and invest in it, buy it sometimes, sell it sometimes, go to cash sometimes, tend to, to make more money in gold and silver than people who simply buy and hold it. It's a empirically proven piece of evidence, uh, not only in precious metals, but in other assets too. And that if you do that, you'll do better. And if you do better, you're more interested in gold and silver. It's a message we've been delivering to gold and silver producers. Now, as you've been here over the last couple days, and if you were in the silver producer session last yesterday, they were talking about the, the, the executives are saying, well, we're, we're very well aware now that these markets are cyclical. They rise and they fall. And we have to protect our companies so that we can uh, live in the bad times, because the bad times sometimes last a long period of time between the spikes. And during the question period, somebody said, so what are you doing to prepare yourselves for the bad times? And one of the executives answered that question. But the question should have been, what do you do to capitalize on the good times? And I'll finish with that when I get back to it, because the end of my discussion relates to mining shares and, and, and what could and should be done in order to make mining shares a more profitable investment for all of us in this room. But for an investor, you have to be aware of this. I started in this business in 1978-79, and I remember when the gold price got over $200 in 79, on its way to 850, and I was talking to a senior, probably the granddaddy of, of mine, gold mining investment analysis, uh, George Cleaver at Merrill Lynch, and he said, well, the price of gold at $300 today, where do you think it's going to be in March? And I said, $500, and he said, that's ridiculous, um, $500 gold. So it got to $850 in January of 1980, and he called me up and said, what a fool you were, you know, $500. And I called him up in March, and I said, I I told you $500, I didn't tell you which direction it was coming from. <laughs> but in that discussion back in September of 79, I said, now when it gets to 500 or wherever it stops, all these guys are going to sell and go away, right? And he laughed. He said, no, gold producers don't do, uh, gold investors don't do that. When it gets to 500 or wherever it stops, they'll say, gee, I'm really smart and I'm really wealthy. And then the price will fall back to 100 or 150 or 180 dollars. And they'll say, gee, I was smart and wealthy and I will be again someday. And they'll hold it until such time as the price rises. And you can see from these charts, unfortunately, I should have done it either as a percentage change or as a semi-log scale so you could see that the percentage changes in some of these moves in the earlier years were just as big as the moves in the later years. And the problem is not just that producers don't think about how to capitalize from the peaks. Investors don't either. You know, we have investors who bought a lot of silver on our advice at five, six, seven, ten dollars an ounce in the period 1999 to 2005. And when the price got to $49 in April of 2011, we were on television saying, this is it, sell. And they didn't. And it got back to $10, $15. And they said, well, I was really wealthy once and I will be again and they're still holding it. But they would be even wealthier if they had sold at 49 and repurchased it fourfold at, at uh, $12 when it fell there. That's one of the ways that investors get precious metals wrong. Some investors think that precious metals are not investments, they're not financial assets, they're something special. You hear all of this talk about the golden constant and the gold's constant purchasing power. In 2018 dollar terms, the gold price in 1700 was $5,500. It's never been there again. 
It's fallen steadily throughout the last 300 years. And that's not surprising, because if you look at pound sterling, it has fallen steadily too. Currencies, or anything that earns interest, loses value over time, both because of the interest-bearing nature of them, but also because of inflation. And if you look at the book, The Golden Constant, Roy Jastrom wrote it in the 1980s, he was a mathematician, and he got this data going back to 1700, and he showed that the price of gold varies greatly in inflation-adjusted terms. The purchasing power of gold varies on a scale of 100 to 800 over the last 40, 50 years of free gold prices. And he wrote in the book, his publisher chose the title, I cannot understand where the concept of gold having constant purchasing power comes from. Gold is a very good asset to hold to protect against catastrophic inflation, but over time it loses value against inflation and against its interest-bearing aspects. And that's in boldface in the concluding chapter. It's very interesting because several years ago a gold promotional group bought the rights to republish it and they put a chapter in that they wrote about how this book is a landmark study talking about gold's constant purchasing power. They didn't even read the book. <laughs> yeah. That's another way that investors get it wrong in gold. Our view, it's predicated on 40 some odd years of advising a whole range of investors and investment groups and buy side and sell side uh, institutions, our view is that the best investors that we've known own some gold and silver as a long-term insurance policy against catastrophic problems, both personal and global or national or regional, but they also invest in it and trade it back and forth. Now, we've all seen movies and TV shows and news reports with these trading desks, with banks and trading companies and brokerage houses have these trading desks, and there are people trading assets back and forth, not just gold and silver, but interest-bearing assets, stocks and bonds and everything. And I spend most of my life, we, we tell people who are prospective clients, we're not traders, we're investors. We'll buy an asset and we'll hold it. I still own Gold Corp shares that I bought when Rod McEwen had bought the company initially and it was the, the, the uh, Campbell Red Lake mine was shut. Uh, he had a, a, a labor dispute from the previous owners and it was just a shell corporation in many ways. I still own those shares. And I always tell people I'm a long-term investor. But I'm also a short-term investor. And if you look at these TV shows and the news reports, what are those guys doing? They're buying and selling assets back and forth, not as long-term investors, but to take advantage of shorter-term price moves. And those are really high-priced people. They're, they're, they're real prima donnas. I, you know, as, as those of you who know me, I know I worked at J. Aaron and Goldman Sachs for, for many years. These are really high-priced people. And the banks and brokerage houses and trading companies and institutional investors who pay them know that they're worth it because you can harvest money short-term while still having that long-term exposure. This slide shows you, I started J at working at J. Aaron, I took over their research department in December 1st, 1980. The price was like 500 and I have to excuse myself, but I now have, by virtue of cataract surgery, glasses that I only need to read up close. The price was 595 on December 1st, 1980. I took over, the price had been $850 in January. Somebody said, uh, actually, the head of trading, the partner in charge of trading came in and said, Jeff, are you a buyer or seller of gold at 595? And I said, sell. And I kept that sell recommendation in place until uh, June of 1982 at the time of the Plaza Accord, if though, for those of you who know it. We kept that buy recommendation in place until the first quarter of 83 and said sell. And these are our published intermediate term buy and sell recommendations. We have shorter term ones and we have longer term ones. And the three bars at the bottom and the three tables at the bottom show if you, on December 1st, 1980, the day I started keeping track records, 
said, oh, I don't care what Jeff says, I'm going to buy gold, you would have doubled your money over the last 40 some odd years. You would have a 1.9% annualized rate of return on your gold investment. If you had said, I'm not comfortable shorting gold, but when Jeff says buy gold, I'll buy gold, and when he says sell gold, I'll sell my gold and put the money in treasuries, and then when he says buy gold, I'll, I'll cash in the treasuries and buy gold again, you would have had a 9.6% return. And your million dollars that you started with would be what, $35 million? 30.1 30, 30 $5 million. If you had gone long when I said go long and gone short when I went go, said go short, your million dollars would be 115 million now, and you'd have had a 13.7% return. And that's not the short-term trading that I'm going to talk about in a second. This is two to three year time horizons. And you can see, 68% of the time from 1980 until 2000, we were saying people to people, don't buy gold, go short. Take me to the next level. Which might be why Goldman left to let us go in 1986, and we set up CPM Group as an independent shop. Because it's easier for an independent consulting company to say, go short, don't buy this asset, than somebody who's trying to sell you the asset. <laughs> this is one of the reasons why we left, and said we, we'd rather be an independent company. In November of 2000, and those of you who have a memory that goes back that far can guess why in the second Tuesday of November 2000, we said, we think gold is going past $850. It was about $280, $260 at the time. And we think it's going to go up for many, many years. And we didn't remove that buy recommendation until uh, January 3rd, 2012. That's our gold recommendations, and those are intermediate terms. Those aren't the short-term ones. This is our silver, even better return, buying and selling on it. The reality is that if you look at the gold and silver markets today, the amount of gold and silver being purchased by long-term buy-and-hold investors is 20% of what it was three years ago. They're buying 80% less gold and silver. Some of them have given up the ghost. You know, I'm tired of waiting for financial Armageddon. People keep telling me that the world's going to collapse, and it doesn't. And it goes back to that price chart. Things get really close. Things get really scary. But the capacity of the financial and political leadership of the world to paper over problems and keep things going is really, really big. And people have the capacity to do that. And that's why the price goes up to $1,800, $1,900, and then it falls. Because the cost of letting us go over that precipice is so catastrophic. It's heads on spikes outside the White House. You know? So you can't let that happen. And the capacity to paper over things and keep things going when they get really nasty is enormous. And as a result, you have a lot of people who have been waiting 10, 20, 40 years for a financial collapse of the global monetary system, and it hasn't happened. And they're giving up their ghosts or they're dying. And their estates are selling the gold and silver. But a lot of that gold and silver that they're selling or that their estates are selling is being bought by short-term opportunistic people. So you see coins where long-term investors buy off 80%. And you see ETFs up because those ETFs are shorter-term investors. So why invest in gold? You invest in gold for capital preservation and capital appreciation. I will never tell somebody that they shouldn't have some gold and silver in their wealth, that their portfolio of wealth should be diversified and have some gold and silver as well as assets denominated in their domestic currencies. I think you need to diversify your wealth. You also need to diversify your portfolio which is a subset of your wealth. You also need to think of it as an investment that you buy and sell on a cyclical basis and as a short-term opportunistic investment. Now, here's an example from May. Price was 1287, we said buy this because we think in the next 15 days the price will go up to 1310. 
It didn't. It went to $12.96. Our clients only made $8.60 in 14 days, which was a 0.67% return in 14 days. If you do that on a regular basis, if you can only extract 0.5% per return, and you do that six times a year, you've got a 3% return on your gold and silver. If you do it and you can get 1.25%, and you do it six times a year, you've got a 7.5% return. We have started publishing tr gold trade recommendations, spot gold, buy, sell, or stand aside on Goldex, a Goldex app. We are going to be rolling out gold, silver, platinum, palladium, spot, futures, and options on other platforms over the next few months. Since August, well, we did one in July, and then we got really serious in July, in August. Since August, we've done this mostly with a five-day horizon, and this thing is not up to date. That last trade on the bottom, uh, we said we thought that the price could rise there uh, to 1240 uh, within five days. It rose there in two days. You took our profits. It was a $15 in two days. It was a 1.53% return. And if you look at these returns, and they're not all here, we're harvesting 1.3, 1.5, 1.8% returns on our longs. And when we're losing, we're losing 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.3. So we're winning about the same time amount of times that we're losing, but we're winning three times, two times, three times what we're losing. And so before that trade, we were at a 0.11%. That one trade was $15, and now it's 0.22%. You can do that with a small portion of your wealth while still having that insurance policy against the long-term things. And then there are futures and options. I've shown this thing here before. This was a trade we did on October 7th, 2016. We were sitting around the office saying, where we think it's going? We said, we don't care who wins the presidential election. The price of gold's 1256. We think it's going to 1280. So rather than buy a put or a future, we put together this, straight, this trade and we said, we think the price could go to 1300 by election day. And we told our clients, so here's a strategy. It's a compound option strategy. Rather than buy a $1,300 put and pay $9.20 an ounce, buy this straddle. It's called a butterfly call straddle. And pay $4.70. A month later, the day after, the, the, the night of the election, the price got to 1351. And we thought, it's 1230, should we call our clients and tell them to sell? No. So we waited till Comex opened the next morning, the price was down to 1300, and we only made 125% in a month. Now that was an event-driven event. This is another trade on the short side a few months later. In April of 2017, the price was 1280, and it wasn't rising, nor was it falling. And we said, we think it's going to 1220. Not for any given event that we expected, I mean, it was April, so we hardly thought that impeachment hearings would start by then. But we thought that the price could fall to 1220. So we put together a put straddle for $4.75 an ounce. And within a month, we had our clients unwind it for 161% return. What can you do now? These are some gold straddles because on October 17th when we priced this, we were saying, well, we think the price could go up and down over the next few months. So here's a, a call straddle to take advantage of the idea that the price could go to 1250. And here's a put straddle to take advantage of the, the idea that the gold price could fall back to 1180 uh, at that time. And you can see $4.40, $3.30, and the risk reward ratio, 1.6, 1.68. Enormous potential profit with a capped loss. You know the most you can lose is $3.30 or $4.40. Similar things with silver. Very briefly on mining. Why don't people want to buy mining shares? Well, because they're dogs. <laughs> I mean, look at the blue line, which is the S&P. Look at the green line, which is gold, which has outperformed gold shares. Yeah, these companies have not done well. They've not done well for a variety of reasons, and investors have not done well for a variety of reasons. A lot of the approaches that are used, and I have 12 seconds left, 
just don't jive. They just don't work. They never did work, some of them, and some of them just don't make sense in an era of computerized trading and professional money managers driven by quarterly results. What works less well? Sector mutual funds, true believer funds. You know, this world is going to hell, and just don't worry about it because the price is going to be 2,000 or 4,000 or 10,000. Now, stop believing. Don't invest in your beliefs. Believe and in, invest based on your knowledge. And the misdefinition of success. Success on a mining company is not defined by how many ounces you're producing. It's by the dollars of profits you make. Right? What's needed? Pooling risks through intelligently, objectively run funds, agnostic hedging of positions, and investment managers focused on profits, uh, profitable mining companies. I don't care if a mining company is only earning, two, making 200,000 ounces if it's making more money. In 1990, we had a table in one of our reports and we showed Anglo-American and Hemlo Gold. And Hemlo Gold was producing one-tenth of uh, the amount of gold that Anglo, Anglo Gold was producing and it had the same amount of dollar profits in the previous year. Anglo then retained us to hedge. I, one more thing. <laughs> Going back to my producers, take advantage of the spikes. I've shown you investment options, option strategies for investors. Producers, the next time they see a spike, we, we've structured these in the 1980s and we've structured these since the 1980s. At a peak, you can put together a compound option that will give you that price for several years to come. You give up 10% of any upside above it. You have a predetermined maximum credit risk and you probably don't pay a premium for it. Back in the 80s and 90s, companies did that. There's not a single CFO who would do that today. I had a mining client that I helped build. In the 19, late 90s, they realized that they had brought in $3 billion of capital, produced $3 billion ounce dollars worth of gold, and made $5 billion on their hedge book. They looked at it and they said, we should close down the mines and just run a, a hedge book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.